we're uh, down here at Calico's Restaurant with uh, William Colt talking uh, tall tales and a early aviation and enjoying a little breakfast here at Calico's. Glad everybody could join us this morning. Mr. Colt was just telling me about uh, a great story about uh, a lady parachuting out of balloons with a monkey. Now that's good stuff. Yeah, yeah, and it, it only gets better from there. This woman hangs in the rigging of a ship up in uh, Sausalito when she <laughs> her parachute took, takes her the wrong way. Uh, she lays outside the Salt River down by Phoenix for three hours unconscious because they can't find her. And it just keeps going and going. <laughs> and what year was this? She began uh, jumping uh, from balloons in a parachute in the 1890s up in Oregon. And she toured through the West, uh, performing, and crowds of two, three, five, to even 10,000 people would show up because there wasn't a lot of entertainment in the 1890s. And all she uh, made her last uh, parachute uh, leap uh, in Prescott in 1901. So for a decade, this woman had <laughs> slammed against the earth and houses and all, landing in lakes and <laughs> so. Uh, Quite a story. I'm looking forward to uh, sharing that with the people of Arizona. <laughs> there is so many. That period, 1885 to, you know, into the early 1930s, is so fascinating to me. Are you familiar with a fellow named uh, Ezra Meeker? No, I'm not. What? Ezra's a great story, and I know books have been written. He wrote a lot of books. But the, the long version, short story... Uh, Ezra was born, I believe, 1830, mm -hmm. uh, went west over the Oregon Trail to Oregon as a young man with his family, uh, made a pretty big fortune for himself uh, raising hops, mm -hmm. and then lost everything with hops, aphids, and some other things, and he uh, uh, made another fortune, I understand, doing uh, dehydrated, he found a way for dehydrating fruits, vegetables, in wa and then putting them in waxed cardboard uh, waterproof containers. And he and his son made some pretty good money hauling this stuff into the Klondike during the gold rush. Now you think about that, that's the 1890s. He was born in 1830. So he's a 60 plus year old man or and then, something. And uh, then around uh, 04, 05, right in that period, he was worried a lot like we are today about forgetting our past. And he wanted to commemorate Route 60, uh, the, the, the Oregon Trail. So he got himself an ox cart like he had when he first went west, and he launched out cross country, uh, speaking engagements, doing things. He went all the way back to Washington, D.C., met with Teddy Roosevelt, took his ox cart home. Uh, then he made another trip in 1910 by ox cart across the United States and uh, spoke to Congress. Finally, was getting pushed to have a commemorative half dollar on the Oregon Trail. And uh, then he, uh, uh, 19, I believe it was 14, the National Automobile Company set him up with a car and driver, and he began driving around the country on speaking engagements. And uh, yes, Andy, it is Sunday, but I have a guy here that you need to meet. This is a Mr. Colt. He's written a book, High in Desert Skies, Early uh, Arizona Aviation. This is uh, Andy Archive, uh, Andy Sampson, the archivist from the Mojave Museum of History and Arts. Oh yes, yeah. Andy joined. has put up some wonderful photos uh, on your site, I know, and shared some great pictures. He's uh, joining us this morning. He's watching us live and listening great. to us. Great. But uh, anyway, uh, Mr. Meeker went on to a couple other things. In 1919, his son was building the first gas station complex in the Cajon Pass on the National Old Trails Road. So he went down there and helped him build that. And then uh, 1923 or 4, uh, the last of the Wright brothers was having a deal in Dayton, Ohio, and they invited Meeker, and so he flew back with an open pit cock plane. To, wow. To, to, From ox cart to airplane. What a life. That's really something, yeah. Well, your book, High in Desert Skies, really opened up, I, I knew there was aviation history here before World War II, but this really opened my eyes to some stuff. 
that I was totally unaware of. And it's, it's really amazing when you consider that we're talking early 1920s, I mean, 10 years of statehood. Yeah, yeah, and this was actually 1919 when those first flyers here uh, landed here. Isn't that something? That's uh, 110 years ago, actually. <laughs> And I believe Andy could correct us on that, but I, I'm pretty sure the first airfield was up by the cemetery where Stockton Hill Road is now. I think that was the first airfield. It was the first one, uh-huh. And, of course, the second was the TAT Airlines with Lindbergh. With Lindbergh, right. And uh, the terminal building for that is still here. Mm. It's now, I believe, either Friday Construction or Brown Drilling up off, uh, off Route 66 up there. Excellent. I'll get by and see that. I'd like to see that while I'm here in Mojave County. So this this next book you're going to be writing about this young lady that was yeah. kind of a daredevil. Right, right. And uh, I was actually able to follow her for 50 years, and her story uh, <laughs> continued to get more and more bizarre <laughs> from uh, from her first parachute jump. It was nothing but crazier. So it, it, it gets crazier than parachuting with a monkey. Yes, with a monkey. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, looking forward to sharing that one for sure. And uh, I actually, of course, uh, you know, as a historian, uh, digging everywhere you can. And finally, after maybe three or four years, I came up with photos of uh, Miss Hazel Keys and her monkey both <laughs> up in uh, a library in Oregon that didn't even know they had these photos. <laughs> but uh, so I'm thinking that'll be a, a fun cover shot. <laughs> that. Uh it's amazing some of the photos that are in archives that people don't know about, can't identify. Incredible stories from that period, you know, people, people uh, just like this, I mean, just amazing yeah. things that people were doing. And as a result of watching her story, I came across Thank you. these other tales of circuses and things that were, as you say, and one of the things they did down in Safford, Arizona, was when she parachuted, her husband managed Esau, the snake eater. And the poster says, bring all your snakes and Gila monsters to Hazel Key's show uh, with Esau and meet Esau, the snake eater. And Esau's big thing was eating the heads off the snakes. Uh, so <laughs> talk about bizarre. Well, you know, there's a fellow we need to talk to about this in uh, Missouri. Mm. Louis Keen is... Uh, well, I don't know what to say about Louie. He's, uh, he's a car incarnation of P.T. Barnum, for one thing. He started out with what was basically a truck stop and topless bar type deal in Uranus, Missouri. Ooh. And then he opened, uh, he closed the topless bar, the truck stop, and started expanding the complex. And, and uh, then he opened a fudge factory. You fill in the blanks with all the juvenile humor that you can come up with about the Uranus Fudge Company. And then he bought the county newspaper, because it was going under, and he uh, gave it, started a free county newspaper. But he renamed it, and he got a lot of people upset because he renamed the paper the Uranus Examiner. <laughs> And since then, uh, one of the things he's done is uh, he's been buying up circus sideshow memorabilia. And he currently has the world's largest uh, circus sideshow museum. All the stuff back, back, you know, all the weird posters and the stuffed two-headed turtles. And, oh, I would love to see that. And uh, so he well, was... Well, I'll stop by Uranus when I get a chance. He would wow. really like that. That sounds really interesting. Yeah, I kind of got into that. I, you know, I've been railroads and airplanes, but all of a sudden this fascination with, as you say, the all the amazing things that people did for entertainment and their money. Um, well, entertainment and money and, and daring. And <laughs> yes, and then I, at one point my wife said, boy, this woman sounds like evil Knievel in a way mm -hmm. from our generation, you know? Uh, just one of those, okay, I'll do the wildest thing I can to get his, you know, to, for the thrill and for the daring and the whole thing, yeah. I lean, you know, towards the automotive side of things, of course, uh, in those years, but the transition, a lot of people don't realize that, like, bicycles, they were the key, and it became a huge boom in the 1890s. That gave ro rise to the Good Roads Movement. The League of American Wheelmen gave rise to that, and it's astounding the numbers. Uh, 
uh, I can't remember, you know, off the top of my head, but by 1893, 1894, there were hundreds of uh, bicycle companies here in the United uh -huh. States. Uh, the Wright brothers were manufacturing, mm -hmm. doing that. Uh, and racing, bicycle racing was big. Barney Oldfield started out racing, racing bicycles. Racing bikes, yeah. And they were doing incredible things, petitioning for good roads. They were taking uh, two and three hundred mile trips on bicycles. Wow. And promoting for good promoting, roads. Promoting the roads. Because they were touring and doing things. And then, you know, the automobiles. I've got a great little uh, pocket postcard. It's really a postcard, but it's a little pocket advertisement from uh, 1896 Barnum & Bailey Circus. And uh, they, they, they gave the Duryea Motor Wagon, one of the first production automobiles, they gave the Duryea Motor Wagon top billing over the Albino, uh, and the bearded lady. <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> that's great. I'd love to see that one too. <laughs> the albino and the bearded lady, huh? But as, I don't. <laughs> not that I've come across tops a a lady jump, parachuting out of balloons with a monkey. <laughs> that that one's going to stay with me. Oh, good. Well, I'll get you your complimentary copy so as soon as I can get that into production. Uh, I uh, my friend uh, down in uh, Tucson, a journalist and historian. Uh, Dave Devine is writing a book on bicycles hmm. uh, in Arizona, and I'm uh, sure he would like to make contact with you and see uh, what information you all might be able to share. To, uh, he got pretty excited about, as you say, all the ways that people used that mode of transportation on these rough, rough highways, well, not highways, dirt roads. You wonder how much drinking was involved with some of these ideas and things that people <laughs> came up with. Well, now this guy, the first fellow that flew in Arizona, Charles Hamilton, uh, flew in Phoenix, Tucson, and Douglas, and uh, he was thought to be Glenn Curtis's craziest flyer, and uh, years later, the Air Force Research uh, Department declared that he always flew drunk and always carried his pistol loaded and ready to go, because in Alabama, uh, some farmers who had quite a superstition when he was flying a, uh, his balloon before airplanes over Alabama started firing at his balloon because they weren't sure what it was and this <laughs> was appearing in the sky so he vowed always to carry his so he pistol. could return fire so he could return fire golly <laughs> but uh, yes I'm sure liquor must have played a part this guy it sounds like always flew drunk he suffered 63 ca uh, crashes Jim uh, broke almost every bone in his body, uh, uh, sat down on a burning seat and burnt himself badly, almost drowned when his engine crushed him in a lake. But he managed to survive all that until 24 when he died of tuberculosis. But that's another one of those wild, crazy... <laughs> you just, yeah, you just ask yourself. You know, I, the reason I mentioned the drinking with these early things is that... Uh, the Desert Classic automobile races, oh, yes. 1914. Uh -huh. When they first come up with that idea, <coughs> there had to be drinking involved. <laughs> to even conceive of that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> let's drive, cause, see, see which is better, steam or gas cars, and let's drive across the desert. And head out into nowhere land huh, to see. <laughs> yep. Well, those early automobiles are fascinating, too. Yeah, and there were some real adventuresome people back then. Another guy that I've been doing some reading on is a, a Norwegian, by a fellow by the name of A.L. Westgard. Mm. I don't know if you picked up on his mm. name, but uh, early, 19, 9, 10, 11, 12, he was uh, mapping roads for uh, Automobile Club of South Southern California, uh, uh, AAA, and uh, he was mapping all these road systems for automobiles, and, and incredibly... He was covering sometimes 20,000 miles a year by automobile, you know, in these years. Just trackless places, you know. Right. Oh. And you've seen photos of the, uh, the trip, and you can probably tell me more about it, down to the bottom of the Grand Canyon there. Uh, yeah, there's the, the road that goes uh, Diamond Creek. Mm. You, know, you can drive to the bottom of the Grand Canyon. That was a major attraction for people on the National Trails Road. There was even a hotel down there at one time. Is that right? Mm. Well, these fellows that first flew out of Kingman, uh, they actually were planning to make Flagstaff their home, but found a much better reception here in Kingman by the, uh, the people that uh, were preparing the airfield, were pro mm -hmm. uh, promising to provide gas and oil for them. And so Kingman uh, 
became uh, the spot from where they from where they flew to take the first photos and uh, movies of the Grand Canyon. And when that first fella went down over the rim, he said it felt like the nose of his plane was hit by a hammer. And he just pulled it back up out of there and got out of there. Well, then I guess the current suggested and they were able to fly down into the gorge. And uh, But they came back and one of the great quotes out of the uh, uh, Mojave Minor was, uh, better fellows have never visited Kingman, Arizona and our latch string is always on the outside. <laughs> <For them. laughs> well, Andy, if you're in the neighborhood, even though you've you already done your eating, we've got some good coffee here and conversation going. Come join us. Uh, and you know those early planes, it's just uh, another great aviation story that I really laugh about. Uh, you probably heard about World War II. Uh, B-17 with engine trouble over the Grand Canyon. Uh -huh. And the crew parachuted out. And I was reading some interviews with a couple of the fellows that it was at night. And they didn't know where they were at. They parachuted out and they could see some lights. They thought it was Flagstaff. And next thing they know, the lights disappeared and they were still going down. They parachuted and into they the had gone into the canyon. Yeah. Isn't that wild? And all of a sudden, it just disappears. Yeah. Whoa! <laughs> and we're still going down. Man, <laughs> I love it. Wow. Well, one of the people I interviewed for my book uh, was the uh, pilot that did all the aerial photography on the uh, not crash in the 1950s of the uh, two passenger planes. Oh, up in the canyon. Yeah. Yeah, and he would dive down into that thing, jet warp speed and take these photos and then back and forth through the canyon taking these photos. He said it was one of the more amazing assignments he'd ever had. Uh, Chris Fuller, I think he's based out of Phoenix now, he runs a small outfit called Aviation Archaeology. Oh. Real interesting fella and he, he researches plane wrecks and locates them. Mm -hmm. Any personal effects he returns. And it's nice. Yeah, he's come up with some pretty amazing things over the years. Out here at the Kingman Army Airfield, the old King and Airfield, there's a monument to a mid-air collision. Mm. Well, I don't even know what the odds of this are, but kind of a long story, but uh, a fellow was looking for information. His father, I believe, was a navigator on the 17. It was a Texas trainer in a B-17 mid-air collision. Planes broke up. Mm. About 1991-92, and you can find this on Chris Fuller's website. They went out looking for uh, anything, tangible links, or any, any wreckage, things they could find out by Red Lake. They actually found his father's dog tags in the desert. Wow. I don't even All know, these years later. I don't even know how you would get odds like that. Oh, really? What are the odds? That's pretty fabulous, man. You know, I, I get, it's kind of sad that when, in school, Kids are turned off on history. It's taught as something as dead and boring as an insurance seminar. Right. And it's really not. It's, it's very fascinating, exciting stuff. It really is. Uh, I just came from the Arizona Historical Society Conference over in Prescott there, and one of the sessions was about how to involve youth in history. They had some good ideas, and, and one of the things I see you doing, Jim, is start, just starting locally, you know, Find some things and say, this happened here, right where you live. And hopefully, you know, uh, one of the, uh, the things, too, is participation for yeah. young people. You know, how do you pan for gold or uh, a, a, a number, you know, tie a, a square knot. I guess there's a number of things you could do that could lead into an exploration of history and why these, these particular skills were needed. A lot of ways you could go. There's a museum in California. I covered the opening many years ago when I was writing for uh, Cars and Parts. And they addressed that very issue. It was the Automobile Driving Museum. And they said, how do you get kids involved with old cars when they don't, uh, they, you know, the old stuff that you just yeah, don't. Right. So the core of this museum is on Sundays you pay a few dollars extra and they take you for a ride. And you don't know what it's going to be. It could be a DeLorean or a Pacer or a 1905 Cadillac or the rumble seat of a Model A. Oh, and man. It, and I thought here in Kingman, you know, we have that old section of Route 66 uh, on 4th Street. It was on National Old Trails Road, dead ends out there. Uh -huh. It's about five miles. And it's perfect. It's paved, and it, but it is no traffic. But there's no traffic. And it's a 1913 
uh, Highway through 1937, National Trails Road and Route 66. I thought, wouldn't it be neat to have a couple Model Ts here and give people a, a Great Depression theme park kind of tour? Yes, yes. Boy, that, that might inspire a child, huh? Who feels as they rumble down the road, you know, in an older vehicle like that on an older highway, might just come alive with the idea of what life was like then. Your book, uh, this is available on Amazon? Oh, yes, I'm, and uh, available on Amazon and at my website, highindesertskies.com. Highindesertskies.com. Very uh -huh. good. And uh, my uh, book, Tucson Was a Railroad Town, is also there. That's a study of the Southern Pacific Railroad steam engine days. So, uh, both of those can be found at highindesertskies.com. Well, it's a very interesting book. You know, when we talk about there's no real money in writing, but we have, a, we have in my opinion, we have an obligation. We're blessed with gifts and talents, and we have an obligation to develop those. And uh, so we can be a blessing unto others. And, and if we make money, God bless. But, Boy, Jim, um, I think you hit the nail on the head. There's some obligation that I certainly feel to collect these stories while, while they are still uh, accessible. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you're doing a wonderful job of getting these uh, stories of Mojave County and, and Route 66 and Kingman here. And I'm excited to uh, dig deeper into our history here and see what we find. Well, Andy's a good good resource. Andy comes up with some of the most amazing stories, and he shares them on old happenings in Kingman. A lot of them. Oh, okay. I on need a to, Facebook, I, yeah. I oh, okay, I should go ahead and, and uh, look at. I didn't realize that he had that site, but I would like to see that certainly. It's uh, on our Facebook page. Ah, yes. I'm hoping to get a chance to visit with him uh, uh, tomorrow uh, about uh, some of my family history here in uh, the Kingman area. See what photos and information he might be able to share with me about White Hills and Todd well, Basin and some of these. I would be curious to see what your family history is since there, it seems your family and my wife's family intersected once or twice in Tombstone or Kingman or somewhere around yeah, these parts. Yeah, that's very interesting. And as you say, the world's such a tiny little place. Yeah, but, uh, you, you find things. It's just. Yeah, it'd be interesting to share, share uh, stories with uh, your wife. Well, when did, uh, how far along are you on this book about the. Uh, Parachutist, just getting started, or mm. no? I'm actually in my uh, my final edits before I pass it on to a proofreader and dot all my T's and cross all my eyes. And uh, so I'm hoping, you know, uh, with my railroad book, I had to send out three letters of apology because I give people dates, <laughs> and then it wouldn't it would take longer. So I'm hope my shot is for is uh, September. I would hope to have this in print by then, and uh, so it's close. Are you uh, doing self-publishing? or? Well, you know, it's a story that everybody I've shared it with, Jim, has said, boy, this is a movie. And so uh, I'm really going to try to uh, uh, pass my manuscript and submit it to some much larger presses and see if I could get... Uh, she, she traveled throughout uh, the whole western coast, Alabama, uh, Texas, uh, and uh, the Midwest, and so um, I'm hoping that I can get a broader distribution that I don't feel I could get self-publishing at this point. Mm -hmm. And if I can't, I'll self-publish and you know, and market it myself. As you say, not not excited about making money, but I think people are going to get a real kick out of this yeah. story. No, I'm not. You know, money can't be the end all, but right. Eating on a regular basis is good. And, you know, that's and, a good idea. And if you get a chance to uh, to go ahead and pay for your costs. Your, your partner's probably not quiet, or she's probably more excited about it than I think my well, you know, I, but uh, at least break even. But, you know, yeah, you're right. I've had the grandest adventures doing this. I've got into Jay Leno's garage, and oh, I've ended up in Czechoslovakia, and just all kinds of things. And the people I've met, the friendships I've made have been just incredible. And then to pay for the writing habit, I've, I've been, had to be creative and develop things like these programs and mm -hmm. Jim Hinckley's America websites and... And it's a, it's a grand adventure. Yes, well, uh, that's very exciting. In, in Czechoslovakia, I saw that uh, that you were there. We uh, we were there this last summer. Boy, I sure enjoyed it. That is Prague, and it was uh, quite a city. And, uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's amazing. And, and we are so blessed, my wife and I, on these trips. We've, we've developed some very dear friendships overseas. So we've always been able to uh, never really be a tourist. We, we travel with friends, we stay with friends, and right. you know we, we, we do things. And we get into some great adventures. And I have no clue, for people who follow me, 
Maybe they can help answer this. But I get all these questions about, are you a redneck? I, I don't know where they come up with this. Hmm. People always ask me this, and just it's odd. But we took some great red, redneck-isms to Europe this last year. We, uh, people we were traveling from, with uh, on part of the trip were from the Netherlands, and we were in Poland, and our little Fiat, the uh, rear passenger window, fell down in the door. So we took the door apart and used a hammer to hold the window up. And <laughs> then we lost the air conditioner, and, and Annika found a place that she could kick the floor, and the air conditioner would come on. Come on! <laughs> And then we lost the transmission in uh, near Lingenfeld, Germany, and we, 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 I got a hold of some friends I knew, and they were so generous, they lived in uh, near Worms, uh, uh, Dittelsheim, near Worms, Germany, and they were so sweet, they came down and fetched us. It was a Sunday morning, and the uh, nearest Fiat dealership was closed until Monday, but we towed a Fiat down the Autobahn for 75 kilometers with, with a rope. <gasps> with a rope? Well, oh, there's some generous friends. Oh, wow. So, All right. The world is full of adventure. Huh? We that's, just look that's forward. That's great. Ha, ha. Kudos, senor. Was that your first trip to Europe? Or? Uh, no, uh, we've uh, been going maybe the last 15 years or so. My uh, son uh, was uh, with the uh, U.S. Embassy in Paris. Oh, wow. And so uh, we got to uh, spend some time there and... Uh, I got into Germany, Italy, uh, uh, love Amsterdam and, oh, and yeah, Holland. We we stayed at a national park outside of uh, Amsterdam for a uh, couple weeks there. That was a real interesting trip. So, uh, no, I really enjoy Europe and seeing uh, different different styles of, of living and <laughs> different foods. Oh, food. <laughs> Music. Oh. The food and the beer. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, we got into this place in... Uh, Romberg, Germany. And this fellow, the story was that he had a, somewhere in the 1500s, he had gone to a larger community and bought his hops and brought it back and his shed ca caught on fire and almost burned it completely. Out of money, nothing to do, he used the hops to make his beer. Well now, two and a half centuries, three centuries later, this beer takes like you're having a brat and a beer at the same time. It was the most amazing beer I think I've ever had. <laughs> I don't know what half of the stuff we've eaten in Europe is, but it was all it was all good, and it was because it was shared with friends. This last trip, we got into uh, uh, Germany, the Czech Republic, Poland, Slovakia, and Austria. Oh man, that's a great and, trip. Uh, yeah, it was yes. a good trip. Yes. We've uh, started late in life. This is our third trip to Europe. Uh, and we haven't covered much. We've been uh, Netherlands, Belgium, Germany. And all that. That's but great, it, though. Yeah, I just, I just can't say enough about Europe. Yeah, nor I. It's fun. I mean, it's amazing when you sit in a restaurant. I was, uh, I think we were in Antwerp, and uh, I was talking to this fellow. I says, uh, how long has this, build, this restaurant been here? And he says, well, we really don't know. And I says, but there's been a restaurant in this building since at least 1490. You know, and you just... I know. Yeah. You hear the whispers, don't you? You, you see the grins on the walls, yeah. Yeah, those things, you run into things like that. We were in Portugal, and we heard, we went to an old bull ring. No, no one really there, but we heard noise down, and we thought, oh, is that a little restaurant? We're kind of hungry. We walked down the hill, and it was a family having... Um, a party for uh, her sister that she had finally located after 45 years in the United States. These Portuguese family were celebrating this woman being there. So they invited us in and shared their food and wine and <laughs> those things that you get when you are out and about and uh, talking to people is, are pretty fun. It's, that, 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 it's the people and you know that's what's, yeah. that's what's driving the whole Route 66 thing oh. is the people. I see. Because you know Route 66 is not the most historic or scenic highway, but it's always had the best press and publicity. And now it, it's, it's morphed into this time capsule that's wrapped in a 2,000 mile long amusement park. And it, it's astounding. It, I mean, it's really astounding the generosity, the friendship. It becomes literally a family. You can be in De Praal in Amsterdam and be talking Route 66, and before you're done, there's 40 people talking Route 66 from Belgium, Germany. And oh, wow. And you know, oh, did you try the pie in this cafe in Texas? And we're just you know, going and talking. And like the, the European festival in uh, Zlin, the Czech Republic. 
something like 20,000 people from 10 countries, having a cruise night through town with vintage American cars and Patsy Klein music. And, oh, and it, it was like in a small town, American festival, but here I couldn't understand anybody or read anything. Uh -huh. just, but oh, all celebrating that. That's exciting. I'm going to have to uh, make sure I, sure I stay in touch with you the next time yeah. something like that's going because I would love to go. We're, we're working on the next one will probably be 2020 in Poland. In Poland. Yeah. All right. Great. Great. I'll uh, follow up with you on that because that really sounds like it'd be so fascinating and fun. You know, God bless. I'm glad you got up here and I'd like to thank you for doing this this morning. and Thank everybody who's been watching this this morning. Hope we made you a little hungry uh, for both food and books. And uh, of course, I'll be with you again next Friday morning, unless we can find some more interesting people to talk to, like Mr. Call. And I will have uh, information about his book up later this afternoon on the Jim Hinckley's America page. And Andy, we'll see you soon.